Two painful hours later, we're finished. Dr. Elm was right about the shots. They didn't hurt all that much. The cleansing, as he called it, was a different story. Apparently, our bodies had undergone a lot of damage from radiation over the time we've spent in the wasteland, causing small problems in our systems that he needed to fix. How did he fix this, you ask? By making us drink a potion, putting us into our own private restrooms, and letting our bodies just... flush it out. Yeah, it was not fun. The gut pains from it still made my stomach twitch in irritation. This was followed by running a small laser over our bodies that removed any kind of small defects in our DNA, and fixed it. Once this was done, I felt like I had just ran through a fire. He proceeded to push us into an extremely cold shower to force us to wash every single reachable inch of our bodies. I felt more violated than what was done when I was in the bathroom. At least Stormy was lying about the powder. He also took our armor and barding and had them cleaned. But he made sure not to mess with it at all, like what Wingnut had asked for. But all in all, when it was over, I felt better than I had in a while. Sore, but better. Okay, Bite. I'll say that your body is quite remarkable for a mare who has lived in the wasteland her entire life. You have the least amount of damage, Elm said. I lived in a place a lot like this, called Trotston my whole life. I didn't get out much. Spent most of my time around sterile environments. She said with a shrug. Yes, that would make the most sense. I have heard that Trotston is quite a remarkable place. He said, then looked over at Wingnut. You, my lad, were a lot worse. Though, still well for the life that I have heard you've lived. He shrugged. What can I say? Shadow makes me take a lot of baths. I do not, I said. Though that's a good idea. He laughed. Okay, fine. My mom used to when I was young, and I just kept up the habit. A bath three times a day wouldn't make you any healthier, Wingnut. What I think it is, is that you have a natural resistance to magical radiation. It happens from time to time. As for... You, Shadow, he said, looking at me. Yeah, I'm sure it's the worst. I've been around a lot of radiation and more for the past couple of weeks, I said, rolling my eyes. Actually, no. You had no signs of any radiation sickness in your system. Your DNA is the same as it would have been when you were born. Your body shows no sign of ever being sick or having any issues. And everything I would for most ponies who came here just to be safe. But still, it's like you've never stepped hoof outside of a clean space. It's quite odd if I do say so myself. Tell me, have you had a cold or the flu or anything like that? He asked. I had a bad heart when I was young due to a dark spell, but that's like all I can think of. I said, wondering where he was going with this. Ah, uh, yes. Your scans show that, but you are better now. What I mean, however, is that you show no signs of ever having truly gotten sick. A natural virus, like every pony gets, he said. Wait, Shadow, you've never had a cold? Wingnut asked. No, not that I can think of. I've seen Auntie get them now and then, but I used to have to take care of her when they got really bad. But I've never gotten it. Thought I was just lucky. I replied. I wonder if it's because of Aquila, Bite said. No, I don't think so. From what Grimm has said, Aquila just joined Shadow when she was six years old. She should have gotten sick a number of times before then. That is quite odd. I'll have to ask Grimm about it later, he said. How strange is it that a pony never gets sick? I asked. Well, I've never heard of it in my entire life. This is why I find it so strange. Very strange indeed, he said. So you're saying that for some strange reason that you can't explain I'm a perfectly healthy pony? I asked. That's right, he said, still looking over at me. Okay, then can we finish this all up? I asked. 
It took him a moment to answer. As he sat there, thinking to himself, I saw Byte go over to his terminal and start doing something with her Mark II. As she worked, Dr. Elm finally said, I guess so. The director mostly wanted you three cleaned of any toxins that could damage our home. You're as clean as they can be, so... I guess we're finished here. Not just yet, Byte said as she lowered her hoof and started to type on his terminal. Dr. Elm turned around, seeing her there, and his eyes went wide. What the hell do you think you're doing? You said I could try to break into your terminal. So I am. I'll admit the security on this thing is amazing, but still, I've seen better. Well, truthfully, I've made better she said as she stared at the screen, her tongue sticking out as she worked. Hmm, let's see. Level 10 firewall surrounded the main sector of your interface. Very nice, but sloppy. Just need to make a path around the firewall and keep it intact. That firewall is not the only thing you'll have to worry about, young filly, Dr. Elm said, looking smug. She went back to do something on her Mark II. I guess she was using the broadcasting system to make her hacking software working on the terminal. Then she went back to it. Oh, I know. I saw your little reverse virus attack nodes. I've already taken them out. They don't work on my pip buck. Yeah, they were a little pathetic. Hmm. Let's see. Okay, so there's a second firewall behind the first, and two more traps with a fake file system to throw me off. Too bad my program makes it light up like a beacon, or that might have worked. You've got another dummy program and two fake firewalls and more pathways followed by self-destruct programs in case I get too deep, she said as she continued to work, mumbling to herself. I'll give her this. She is a determined little filly. I've had my smartest techs try the same thing and none of them could get. He started to say, but bite through up her hooves with a triumphant look in her eyes. Winner! I've managed to get to the main program without changing anything in your systems, and hidden myself so that when I pull out, you'll never know I'm in there. So boom, I win. You're a stupid doctor bug. Give me free shit. She said, leaning back in his chair. What? That's impossible. He said, running over to look at the screen behind her. His jaw dropped. How, how did you... How is that even possible? You're, you're just a filly. A filly with an IQ of 217. I've been building and programming terminals better than this one since I could walk. Like I said, so now you owe me stuff. And I want the said stuff. Let's cough it up, broski. She said. Ah, how are you this smart? He asked, looking ready to pass out. I just am. Wingnut's almost as smart as I am. Only with structures and other engineering things. To be fair... My pip buck had some of the best hacking software around, which helped a lot. I'll admit you made good security system, but it wasn't good enough, she said, getting off his seat and walking towards me. Can you believe this buck? He thought I couldn't do it. I just smiled. What can I say? Ponies have a tendency to underestimate you. Dr. Elm slammed his hoof on the table. It's not fair. You must have cheated. Nah, I was a good little filly. By the way, Doc, where's my lollipop? By lollipop, I mean my prize. None of that sugar-free crap like a t-shirt and my name on the wall. I said smugly. The door to the clinic opened, and the voice I heard said, Dr. Elm, why is it taking so long for you to finish up in here? And why are you attacking your desk? It was the voice of the director. Dr. Elm's eyes went wide as he said, <clears throat> Madam Director, my, my apologies, but this mare managed to hack my terminal. I turned to get my first look at this mysterious director of the ministry and instantly had the feeling that she looked familiar. She was taller, with a bright white coat and a mane the color of falling leaves in autumn. Her eyes, the color of the setting sun. On her flank, I saw a tree in full bloom and she reminded me a lot of her vein in the way her body was built, even a little in her voice. She smiled and started to laugh. Dr. Elm, I thought you said no pony could hack your terminal. Miss Director, ma'am. He said that if I could do it, he'd give me stuff. Now he's saying I cheated, 
And I didn't. I said, looking angry. Because you did, and that's the only explanation, he said. She ignored him, looking over at Bite, with a kind smile. Your cookie bite, if I remember right. Tell me, what did he promise you? Five high-yield magical energy crystals, 500 caps, and a weapon of his, he said. Right, Wingnut? Yeah, that's what he agreed to, Wingnut said, grinning over at the panicking doctor. Well then, if he's not upholding his side of the deal, then we'll just have to do it for him. Later today, I'll make sure you get what you're asked for, and I'll throw in one of my own weapons instead. Seeing how he bragged to everyone here that no one could get past his security, I think you've earned it for knocking him down a peg or two. Although I do have to ask why you'd want something as dangerous as those crystals? The director asked. It's for a project I'm working on. I need them to power it properly without losing the kick it needs to have, she replied. Hmm. Interesting. How long did it take you to get into his computer? The director asked. I don't know, like five minutes? Maybe less? I wasn't really counting. Byte answered, sounding like it was easier than getting dressed in the morning. Hmm. Grimm said you were smart. After we finish helping Shadow, we'll talk. Okay? Same with you, Wingnut. I'd love to hear about your talents, too. She said, giving them both a smile. Thank you, ma'am, they both said. Oh, and so polite, she said, looking back at me as Dr. Elm walked away, going to his private office. Hello, Shadow Star. I'm glad to finally meet you after so many years. I'm... Before she could finish, the way she looked finally clicked, and I knew her name before she could say it. You're White Oak. Box tape's wife that died years ago? Auntie Vervain's mother? What's going on here? You should be 20 years older. And dead? Are you a synth? You have to be a synth. That's the only explanation. Her eyes went wide as I said that. You know my daughter. You know my husband. Grimm didn't update me on any of that. How are they doing? Is Box Tape still giving his customers a hard time? Has Ravain left that stable yet? Oh, I've missed so much over the years. She stopped to take a breath and calmed herself. I'm sorry. Let me answer your question first. No, I'm not a synth. And I don't let the way I look fool you about my age. I'm a lot older than you'd think. But I... I don't understand. It w Wait. You didn't hear about box tape? I said already feeling the tears well up as I remembered his death. I could see it now. Box tape falling off the palisade, pulling his pistol to shoot Wolfsbane, him falling to his death with a smile on his face. Waddock's eyes went wide as she said, I heard something happen to Cartwheel, but lately it's been hard to get updates on everything going on in New Pegasus. Tell me that box tape's okay. A single tear fell as I shook my head slowly. No. Wolfsbane destroyed Cartwheel. He took my friends and I prisoner, and Box Tape came to rescue us when we were fighting to get away. Wolfsbane took me hostage and forced Box Tape to get out of his armor. Then, another fight broke out, and Box Tape protected me from an attack by Wolfsbane and was kicked off the palisade, falling to his death. Her eyes were watery as she asked quietly, My son killed Box Tape. He killed his father. Yeah. It happened a few weeks back, I replied. She took a long moment to get her emotions under control before finally saying, I want you to tell me everything that happened there while we are headed to the conference room. Once you're done, I'll tell you my story. I nodded. All right. Bite, Wingnut, and I followed White Oak out of the doctor's office, to where Aura, Solstice, were waiting with Stardust and Windthrasher. Mom and Oricalis weren't there. I guess they had other places to be right now. My friends didn't say anything as we walked by. Just followed as I started to tell White Oak about what happened to her husband. 
didn't take long to go over what had happened when the Lost Holocron Steel Rangers attacked, but by the time I finished, we'd walked past two or three areas of the Ministry and up an elevator that led to the conference room, where three other ponies were waiting. I greeted White Oak, but she ignored them, letting me finish my story. When she, I finally did, she sat at the head of the large table, gesturing for me to sit the next to her. Then she looked at me, saying, The unicorn you threw off the palisade must have been Hacker, my son's wife and head of the scribes. She's a cruel pony who specialized in magical revolutions and torture. You're lucky she just threw you off the top of that airship. But still, I'm sad to hear about Hot Fox Tape died the way he did. Though knowing him, that's the way he would have wanted to go out. I just wish my daughter didn't have to see it happen. Aura spoke up. So, let me get this straight. The whole time we've been trapped here waiting for Shadow and the tiny ones to show up, you've never told us that you're Vervain's mother. I had no reason to. My old life is something I don't bring up to many ponies. It was part of the deal I made when the Ministry let me come here to live, White Oak said. I'd like to know what happened, because from what I've been told, you died like 20 years ago. Vervain has no idea you're still alive. Same goes for Wolfsbane, he said. White Oak took a deep breath, then looked at the other leaders of the Ministry and back to us. A long time ago, I was looking into the same projects that Grim has been. At the time, all I knew was about the one called Project Stargazer, a.k.a. Project Aquila, from the bits of information I found. I had no idea what it could do, but I had a feeling that it was something that could be used to fix what's happened to Equestria since the war. It was later that I found out about Falling Shadows thanks to Grim, she said, tilting her head towards Mom. Where did she come from? I must not have noticed her while I was talking to White Oak. Mom shrugged. I mostly found out because of the files on the Mark II, and information I got from one of Night Stalker's old safe houses, along with the tales I heard from Griffins, who heard it from ponies they worked for in the past. White Oak continued. Yes, that was twenty years ago. I thought I found what I needed to finally unlock the secrets of this project, so I went on uh, what I hoped would be my last mission for the Steel Rangers. Boxtape wanted to come with me, but I told him to stay behind and be there for our children. I was on the outskirts of Lost Solicorn when I found another safe house of the Children of the Night. It took me a few days to find a way to get into it, but I had no idea the place was a decoy and trapped. The should-be safe house exploded, and I was left gravely injured. In the explosion, I lost all of my notes and journals when my saddlebags were blown off of me. If it wasn't for the Ministry, I would have died there and then, like most thought I had. An old unicorn stallion with a bald head said, Yes, White Oak happened to come across a damaged synth. She managed to drag herself quite a ways from the site of the explosion. The synth had enough program left working to send a distress signal to a team of our coursers. They picked her up and brought her here, where we used our technology to heal her and replace the parts of her that were damaged. White Oak spoke again. And thank you, Dr. Sales. Well, he's right. I was almost dead when I got here, and after two months of healing and many surgeries, I was finally able to leave the clinic. What did he mean by replace? Nora asked. Yeah, sounds like you had parts of your body swapped out for something else, Solstice added. I did, she said, lifting one of her forelegs. Back then, our Generation 3 synths weren't complete yet, but we could make nearly identical body parts. I lost two of my legs, an eye, half the skin on my coat, the left side of my body. One lung wasn't working properly anymore. Same for my heart. It was damaged. I lost most of my teeth, and most of my ribs were broken along with my pelvis. Everything was either repaired or replaced with synthetic parts. My heart and one lung and left foreleg and hind eye, my left eye, my skin and my coat. It's all not real, and thanks to that, my body is more than half synthetic. My whole face had to be redone, too, when they start the process. 
my muzzle dropped open. Is that why you look so young? It is. Most of my body doesn't age, so I appear to be younger than I am. Technically, I'm a bit younger, considering I got new parts. It probably added quite a few years to my lifespan, he said. What I don't get is, why didn't you go back home or let your family know you were okay? Bolstus asked. Family's everything. Why would you let them worry about you and think you were dead? A mayor in a military-looking uniform spoke next, saying, She didn't have much choice. Ministry rules state that no pony leaves once they enter this place, and they can leave again. Or, they used to be. Commander Emerald is right. Back then, I couldn't leave once I was in this place. It's to keep the Ministry safe and hidden. I wanted more than anything to let my family know I was okay. I even tried to escape a few times at the beginning. I would have kept trying if it wasn't for the former director. He was a kind old buck who took me under his wing and showed me footage of how my family was doing after my death. I saw that box tape was sad but doing well and running his shop the same way he always had. I saw that he left the Steel Rangers for good. My daughter was training to be a knight and my son was on his way to making paladin. They moved on without me and didn't need me anymore. So I started helping this place and putting my knowledge into making it better. Almost thirteen years ago, the former director passed away, and I was named the new director. Once I was leading this place, I started making changes. Emerald made an annoyed sound and then said, Yeah, she changed how we operate. Not for the better, if you ask me. White Oak glared at her. I know your position on the changes I've made, Commander, but in my leadership we've made huge leaps in synth development thanks to bringing in Dr. Stormy, Grimoire, and others. We are closer to finding the project that can fix Equestria and doing what the first founders of the Ministry wanted when they formed this place. I've always wanted to know, why do you call this place the Ministry? I asked. The last alien who hadn't spoken yet answered, when La Sala Corn was attacked, the six ministry hubs that were located just down the road from the UELA campus joined together and escaped to this underground shelter made by the Ministry of Arcane Sciences. Well, most of them did anyway. We didn't have many members from Image or Awesome, but the rest banded together and started calling this place the Ministry, since every ministry was represented here. So you all just banded together and started making robots, huh? Cool, like a high school science club. Did you make them fight each other too? Stardust asked. Not at first, the stallion said. That came later. We first started by helping ponies escape the fallout from the mega spells and balefire. Later, when the ministry was fully hidden, the ponies who went missing were forgotten. Former members of the MWT and MAS started working on making synths. They were first created to keep an eye on what was going on in the world above, but the project had a lot of problems over the years. The first synths were easy to spot, and not being ponies, and we couldn't really get them to act like normal ones either. So yes, they did fight, but not because we made them. White Oak spoke up next, saying, He's right. A little over 100 years ago, a stallion finally broke one of our the problems that we had with the synths, and we were able to give them a personality. They had two prototypes they tried out, one with memories of a pony from before the war, the second with some memories of a pony from before the war and fake ones mixed in. And the former was a failure and was scrapped. The second one led us to the Gen 2 synths. Well, I should say Gen 2 and a half, really. We had been working on synths way back then. But they broke down fast, their minds not able to comprehend the reason for life. The 2.5 models, however, did a lot better. Wait a sec, I said, looking over at White Oak. Was one of the synths with the memories in the past called Lonely Hearts? You mean X-001? Yes, he was implanted with memories of a police detective during those times. I think his name was Lonely Hearts. Why do you ask? Because I've met him. I also saw a Lonely Hearts in a security camera at the Play Pony Mansion. I knew it couldn't be the one I saw, since synths weren't around back then, I said. 
Ah, yes. Forget sometimes that Lonely Hearts lives in the new Pegasus area, she said. Commander Emerald spoke up and said, He should have been put down years ago, if you ask me. Why? He's a good pony. Well, Synth. But he's helped us in the past, and I like the guy. Because he's a failed experiment that should have been... that should have never gotten out of the facility in the first place. He was scrapped, but some pony a long time ago saved the body and switched him back on, tossing him out of the world above us. It took us years to even find him again, and when we did, he was protected by new Pegasus. She said, sounding angry. I frowned. I agree with Aura. He's not hurting any pony. He should be left alone. He's property of the Ministry, Emerald said, getting to her hooves. You got a problem with that, little filly? I got back to my hooves and pulled Dreamwalker out. Yeah, because he's not just some robot. He's my friend, and he helps ponies. No pony should ever have to be called someone else's property. Who cares if he's a robot or not? And both of you calm down, please, White Oak said, glaring at both of us in turn. Emerald sat back down a moment before I did. She sounds like those goody two-shoed railroad ponies. I bet she's with them. And you sound like a Roman, bitch. I said, muttering the last word. Who are the railroad ponies? Wingnut asked. That's a long story for another time, Wingnut. White Oak said with a heavy sigh. Mom sighed. Can we please get back to the topic at Hoof? We don't have much longer before we're ready, and we need to start explaining a few things. Good point, White Oak said, looking back at us. Putting everything else aside, you know why I'm here now, and you should understand that I've done a lot to start helping ponies in the Wasteland, unlike any other director before me. This is where you come in, Shadow. Over the past twelve years, I've been trying to help your mother cure you. We did so ten years ago, but that led to our current problem, Aquila. About time, I thought to myself. Yeah, about that. How do you plan on getting her out of me? From what I've learned, she's bonded with my very soul. Removing her would kill me, right? Yes and no, Mom said. I can't go over everything, but I can tell you that we have a way to get her out of you without hurting you in the process. The plan is why you needed to come out here. I took a moment to think about it. Then something came to mind. You're putting her into... Mom stopped me. Don't even think about what I'm doing. This is already dangerous because Okula could take that knowledge for herself at any time. The less you know, the less she knows. When I'm ready to start this process, then you'll know because she won't have time to stop me. If everything goes the way it should, you'll be free and more. I huffed. I hate not knowing what's going on, and even more so because I still have a problem trusting you. Duly noted, Shadow, and I understand why. But your friends all know the plan, and they know what I'm doing will work, she said. I looked over at Aura and Solstice, who both nodded. Aura saying, It's crazy, but it should work. I agree. I mean, I don't know how it all works, but the plan itself is sound, Solstice added. I sighed again and leaned back. Okay, then. When do we start? Very soon. I wanted to have time for you to look around the Ministry, learn more about us before we undergo this procedure. As much as we have planned this out, it is still possible something can go wrong, White Oak said. What about when this is all over? What are you going to do with us? With Aquila? I asked. White Oak's left ear twitched, and she took a moment to answer. Then when she did, I knew she was telling me a lie. We'll keep her locked away in a special chamber so they can hold her until she fades away again. You're going to kill her, I said. I didn't say... She started to say, but I cut her off. No. Don't lie to me. You're going to kill her. I can see it in your eyes, I said. What if we did? She's a star spawn. A monster, White Oak said. I shook my head. She's done monstrous things, but she's only like that because of what she had to endure over the past 200 years. She has goodness inside of her. Small, but it's there. Mom looked shocked. Are you defending her, Shadow? I shrugged. 
Maybe a little. Don't get me wrong, I hate the bitch for everything she's put me through. But I also know her better than any of you do. She's a lying, manipulative, dangerous, and powerful creature. She's not as evil as you all think. She was created to do good in this world. She was forced to do bad once her mind was twisted by pain and suffering. If somebody just tries, they can get through to her, and maybe instead of killing her, we can use her to do some good in Equestria? The entire room looked over at me, like I just said we should let the Enclave take over. For a long moment, no one said anything until Windthrasher said, I think I can see where she's talking about. If it wasn't, if I wasn't given a chance to do better myself, I might be dead now. My mind was twisted and controlled over many years, and most ponies would have just put me down. Shadow didn't. She saved me. She looked over at me. You have a talent for finding the good in Pony Shadow. Maybe Aquila has something that's good in her. Maybe she was able to change, she could help the Wasteland. I smiled a little. Thanks, Windthrasher. But even with that said, I don't think it's a good idea to let her live. Windthrasher continued, throwing my hopes that she'd side with me right down the toilet. One of the problems with how you view others is that you don't let yourself see, see them for what they are all the time. Most ponies can be saved, I agree. And you know I hate killing creatures. However, Aquila is too powerful and dangerous for any of us to risk letting her live. She might have been, a, been created to save this world, like you said, but she's not that creature anymore. As soon as she gets the chance, she'll kill you, me, and the rest of her friends. Everyone on the table nodded their heads slowly. Even my uncle, who was as dark as they come, yet managed to change himself. I frowned and looked at every single one of them before saying, I know deep down that if we keep her contained, and try to work with her, she'll come around. Why can't the rest of you see that? Mom just sighed. Because ponies like myself have looked into the research and what we've created her, she's just a force of nature that she's an abomination. She has to be killed, and that's final, Shadow. She wasn't created, I yelled. She was born somewhere else, then pulled down here by Stargazer. She's a living creature, just like the rest of us. I don't like the idea of just saying she's pure evil and killing her. Aura, who was sitting on my left, put a hoof on mine. Shadow, you don't have a choice. She has to die. I know you don't like it, but the way it has to be. Also, how do you know where she was born or created? White Oak asked. I saw one of her memories, I replied. Shadow, uh, Mom sighed. She started rubbing her temples and saying, Shadow, for all you know, that memory could have been fake. She's already manipulated your mind in the past, and it's not hard for her to do it again. The longer she's awake, the longer she's left to merge herself with you, the better control she has over what you do, how you feel, how you see. I knew I wasn't going to win this one. Honestly, I wasn't sure I wanted to. I do hate Aquila. I know she's a danger to myself and my friends, but something deep down was telling me that killing her was wrong. As I thought about it, my mind flashed with a sight of that monster Zoni from... Moonlight's memory crystal. Willow was made of pure light magic, even if she was on the evil side. Her magic was the opposite of his dark magic. But if we killed her and that monster got free from whatever prison he was trapped in, one of Falling Shadows was activated and it was the key to letting him go. I looked back at White Oak. Fine. If that's your plan, then so be it. But I have one stipulation. You let me find Falling Shadows and I'm destroyed for good, so no pony can use it. Her face fell. Shadow, that program could be the key to fixing Equestria. I don't think it is. I've seen a lot of memory orbs from the Children of the Night, and one thing Night Stalker himself was worried about was that the project could actually let something worse out than Aquila. A creature that was locked away for 1,200 years? I can't risk letting it out. But I know that there are other ways to help the Wasteland. It doesn't have to be a project made of any ministry or the children of the night. At least, let me find it and see what it really does before we just blindly activate something that could kill us all. I said. No deal, Emerald said with a frown. White Oak put up her hoof. No, she makes a valid point. But, Director, Emerald and the other two said at once. Quiet. White Oak said before looking back to me. 
I'll make this deal with you. I will let you find Falling Shadows. I'll even give you all the things that I've learned over the past few years, and some of what Dr. Stormy and your mother have on it, too. If you find what this project can help us, then I want you to let me know and we'll activate it. If it is what you think it is, then I'll let you destroy the program for good, or at least lock it down again. I think that's a fair enough deal. I nodded. And it's a deal, Director. She smiled and shook my hoof. Good. Now I think it's about time to get everything started. Shadow, your friends have a room that will fit all of you. I want you to rest up for an hour or so while we finish preparations. Go with them and we'll see you soon. I got to my hooves. Okay, sounds good to me. Solstice, Stardust, Wingnut, Wind Thresher, Aura, and Bite all got up too. My mom and Orikala stayed seated. I looked over at them, but my uncle just smiled. We'll see you in the lab soon. Your mother and I want to make sure it's ready. Okay, I'll see you soon then, I said, following my friends out of the meeting room. The room was only a floor down from the meeting room, and was, as White Oak said, big enough for all of us. There were three bedrooms with a couple of beds in each, a nice-sized living room, and a offset kitchenette next to it. I went way over to the couch and collapsed on it. Finally, a moment to relax. A moment later, I felt Aura sit next to me and pull me close, letting me lay my head on her lap as the others took seats around us. She smiled down at me, then looked at the others. So, since we all have a little time, why don't you three tell us what happened while we were stuck in here? I closed my eyes and smiled. I woke up on a beach full of black sand and bones and ran from some steel rangers. Well, actually hid, but it's the same thing. And then I found those two in a porn magazine house. And Thresher blushed when I said the last part, but the others laughed. The sound made me feel like everything was going to be fine in the world. It was wonderful to be around our friends again. Once the laughter stopped, I let Wingnut and Bite tell the story about what happened when I finally found them again. I almost fell asleep. Something was still making it hard for me to do so. So I just relaxed and enjoyed my friend's company. Half an hour later, food was brought to us by a synth, and we all sat around a large dining table and ate while Solstice told us stories about her time growing up in the Enclave. So, let me get this straight, I said, looking over at Solstice, who was sitting across from me. You grew up in one of the richest neighborhoods in Stratus, and yet you still joined the military? Yeah, it's tradition on my dad's side. And most on my mother's, too, she said, eating some fancy-looking salad. And I've always been more of a violent kind of pony, so it was the right place for me. I graduated schooling when I was 14, joined the officer's corps at 16, and was in active duty a year after that. I spent the past year or so leading teams to the surface, and was ready to rank up again when all this crap happened. I've always wanted to know why you've really helped us, Solstice. You started out as our enemy, Carta said. She shrugged. It seemed like the right thing to do once I talked with Mom. She told me to run after she heard that I was going to be marked as a possible traitor. This was before Nightshade took over, though. I probably could go home now, but I've had a lot of fun down here. Plus, I like you guys. You don't get on my nerves like I thought you would. You still do, but not in the same way. The radio message I heard before coming back me, and I felt my eyes going a little wide as I asked. Solstice, your mother works in intelligence, right? Yeah. Why? She asked. You have a way to get a hold of her? The reason is because I heard something disturbing on the radio yesterday that made it sound like my father might have been attacked by some other faction of the Enclave that's trying to take over Stratus. I finished my small meal. She went pale. Was it Navarro? I think so, but I can't remember everything, I said. I have a communication device, but it was taken when I got here. I'll have to see if the director will let me use it. I need to make sure my mom is okay, she said, getting to her hooves. When Thresher stopped her. I don't think that'll do any good right now. The director's in the lab with Grimm, and they're getting Rithstring ready for Shadow. 
Might have to wait till it's all over. I know it's hard, but there isn't much we can do while we're here. But if Stratus was attacked, then Nightshade was hurt or taken to power. My parents might be at risk, she said, looking scared and frantic. Why would your parents be at risk if my dad's in trouble? I asked. Because my parents have been working with your father for years now to take over Stratus and Nimbus. I only know because my father told me as much a week ago or so when I talked to them last. I need to make sure they're okay, she said, heading for the door. I got up too. I'll go with you. No, you stay here, Laura said. You've got to be ready for this. She looked over at the others. Wind Thrasher, why don't you and Stardust go with her to see if you can find out what's connecting about contacting your parents? Bite and Wingnut, it's time that you start doing what you have for your side of the plan. We don't have much time before they come for Shadow. Yeah, good idea, Wingnut said getting to his hooves and heading for the door. Come on, Bite. Let's do our part. She followed, as Stardust said. Sounds good, Aura. Are you sure you won't need us? We'll be fine. Articalis changed a few things a few hours ago, she said. Wait, what's going on? I asked. Nothing you need to worry about, Aura said before walking over to her bags and putting them on. I'm sure it's about time to finish things with your little passenger. I'll tell you the rest after that. The others walked out, leaving Aura alone with me. She waited at the door to fully close, then dropped her bags again and grinned. Confused, I asked. Aren't we heading out? We've got at least twenty more minutes before they come for you. Maybe a little longer, she said, moving closer. I want to try something with this new body of mine. And you're the perfect test subject. I couldn't help but grin. That came to my stupid face as one of Aura's wings wrapped around me as she led me to one of the rooms.